This video will talk about Easter Sunday and the beginning of the book of Acts, which happens just after Jesus's ascension into heaven. We left the last video talking about the last week of Jesus's life. We said that on Saturday, nothing happened because it was the Jewish Sabbath. By law, people were very restricted what they could do. But the first day of the week, Sunday, begins by Jewish tradition at sunrise. So the women run to the tomb in the garden in order to get Jesus ready for his final burial. They arrive to the tomb and I'm pretty sure anybody knows the rest of the story of the Christian Easter. The stone is rolled away. They are in a panic. They ask what they presume to be the gardener. Do they know where Jesus is? Who took him? The gardener speaks their name, and in speaking their name, they recognize him as the risen Jesus. The Gospels, particularly Luke, will record other post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Incidentally, that's why I liked the word Monday Thursday, rather than using the verbiage, the Last Supper. Monday Thursday Supper was not the last supper Jesus had with his disciples, according to the synoptics. We have records of him eating dinner, eating fish for breakfast with them, and so forth. So Jesus will be uh, with and among the disciples 40 days after his resurrection. A resurrection that Christians believe is literal, physical. The Christian message is not that this is just a metaphor of um, light shines in the darkness or good will overcome evil, kind of a Star Wars theme. A Christian holds to the literal resurrection of Jesus. Forty days then after Jesus's resurrection from a Sunday would be a Thursday. And on that Thursday, every year, Christians commemorate what is called the Ascension, when Jesus ascended into heaven. That was 40 days after Easter, and the Gospels tell us that that happened from the top of Mount, what we would say from the Old Testament, Mount Moriah. Ten days after the Ascension, the disciples who were supposed to go ye into all the world go back into Jerusalem and lock the doors. And this is the day now I want to tell you about. Ten days after the ascension, which means it was 50 days after Easter. Thus, the name of the day is Pentecost. 50 days after Easter, 10 after the ascension. The Ascension was 40 days after Easter. I know it's confusing. I spell that out for you on your handout. So the disciples are there uh, in the upper room, 50 days after Easter. It's in the morning. And suddenly they said that there was the sound of a violent wind that came in through the windows. But what's important there is that it blew on all the people in that room. Wind. The source of power in the New Testament, first century world, that's how you got your ship across the Mediterranean. That's how your blades turned on your windmills so that you could pump water or grind grain. It's why you built your house out of bricks and not sticks. Wind is power. This powerful wind, the wind of God later we're told, blows in. But here's the important thing about this story and we're now in the fifth biblical book, the book of Acts, it blows on all the people. And this is a seismic theological shift in the Bible because prior to the book of Acts, incidentally, written by Luke, the same synoptic writer as the third book of the New Testament, sometimes I just call this Luke volume two, this book of Acts, prior before this, all the holy power of God pretty much is always just in the holy people. 
In the Old Testament, it's only the priest who can offer your sacrifices, say prayers, marry you, bury you, circumcise your boys. In the New Testament so far, it's only been Jesus who's been doing miracles, praying to God, uh, atoning for sins. It's always in the holy people. But what happens here in Acts at Pentecost is that the wind blows on everyone. It's a huge theological shift. But then there appears in the room something that looks like fire. Again, remember the Old Testament. Fire, the metaphor, the presence of God. Remember Moses and the burning bush? Except now we're told that this fire breaks up and goes, this presence, this peace of God, if you will, over everybody's head. Everybody gets the fire. Everybody got the power. And then to illustrate that it's true, what Luke just wrote to you, we have Exhibit A. Peter, a fisherman, goes down to the streets because the people have been gathering, wondering what on earth is happening up there. Remember in first century Roman cities, the streets were only as wide as a packed camel because they wanted to cram as many people inside that walls, those walls as they could. The people are down there going, what on earth is happening up there, Peter? He comes down there to calm the crowd. It's one of the best lines in the New Testament, I think. The crowd said, what are you guys doing? Are you drunk? And the best line of the New Testament is, Peter says, we're not drunk yet. It's only nine in the morning. And Peter explains to them what's happened. And Peter preaches to them. Not a rabbi, not a priest, an ordinary, unschooled fisherman. And it has effect. People convert to Christianity. You see, he has the power. He has the presence of God. It's given to all. That's the message of Pentecost. In the book of Acts, Luke, volume 2, then we'll go on with a series of other evidences. Not just Peter, but then we're introduced to the craziest characters that you would never think would become a follower of Christ. Incidentally, that first group were called people of the way because Jesus had said, I am the way and the truth and the life. They're not called Christ I am's or Christians till quite some time later. We're introduced to this crazy cast of characters. I'll explain some of them to you. Uh, Cornelius, a Roman centurion. That means he was a Roman military officer, a centurion in charge of a hundred men. Today we would call him a brigadier general. He converts to Christianity, a Roman. And we're told that not only he, but he and his whole household, all of his kids, and they were all baptized, which starts the Christian tradition, which it goes from the very beginning, biblical tradition of Christians have baptized their children. Baptism now will replace Old Testament circumcision because you can do it to sons and your daughters. And just as circumcision was given to youths, so the church baptizes their children into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then we're, we meet Lydia, a seller of purple cloth from Thyatira. Fascinating descriptor of her, uh, purple, was a color even more valuable and prized than gold because its dye was more rare and harder to make. She's a wealthy businesswoman. She becomes a Christian and she and her household are baptized. We'll meet up with her again later in the book of Philippians and I'll tell you why in the next lecture. Another strange character, you see what Luke is doing is giving us all these exhibit A, B, C, D, all the characters that now have the power of God blown on them because the wind will blow wherever God wills it. The next guy, an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot going up to Jerusalem. He's from Ethiopia. He was a black man. He was in a chariot. He was a wealthy man. He was a eunuch. A eunuch 
was a male who voluntarily was castrated, you heard me correct, in order to have a high rank in the king's cabinet. The king asked for that as a job requirement so he could remove any risk or suspicion that you only wanted the job because you were really interested in the queen. So here was a wealthy man willing to give up his sexuality to have a job that he had that was so influential, driving in a chariot. He becomes a Christian. Philip meets up with him in the desert, explains the scripture to him, and he's baptized right there. See what the book of Acts is doing, and it really is that simple. Luke volume 2 says this risen Jesus didn't leave people alone. He left them with his spirit. It went to everyone, as did the presence of God. Not just those of the seed of Abraham or to the country of Israel, you see. Now, Christianity will not only be for Israel, those who convert Jews, who convert to become a member of the way, but now Christianity is open to all, this, this gift of Jesus, you see, to whomever the wind will blow on. Exhibit A will be Peter, the first one, to proselytize, fancy word that means preach, to convert. But then we're given a series of strange characters, Cornelius, Lydia, the Ethiopian eunuch. Back to Pentecost, there's one other detail that I intentionally glossed over. And that is that when the people saw the fire, each individually on each other's heads, when they ran around and tried to say, hey guys, you got a fire on your head, you might want to stomp it out, nobody understood each other. Because they were all speaking in different languages or different tongues. Now, here, in the interest of full disclosure, comes one of the first controversies of Christianity. Because there is a group of Christians called Pentecostalists, let's see where the name comes from, who believe that on the basis of that scripture, that then the evidence to this day that one has the spirit or has been called or chosen by God, then is that they also have been given the gift to speak in tongues. That's an important part of the Pentecostalist worship experience and their denomination. The other group of Christians, non-Pentecostalists, see this scripture in a different way. Because the other group of Christians in the controversy say, well, let's look at the original Greek of Luke. And you see there that the verb is not in tongues. The verb is just the predicate. The verb is speaking. They spoke. And that's what's important. That when a person becomes a Christian and have the spirit, they speak about it. The fact that it was in tongues is metaphorical in the sense that that news, people who will speak about Christ, will go now out into all the world, into every language, which is exactly what we'll see in the next lecture, what all the disciples did. We don't. There, there's not a right answer for this course. I, I just want you to know that there are two positions on this Pentecost text. Those who hold that it's right there, they got the Spirit as a direct result of getting the Spirit, they receive the gift of tongues. It's true to this day, would say a Pentecostalist. The other group says, yeah, but look at the grammar there. What Luke meant to write, does write, is that they spoke. That's the point of the text, that anybody who becomes a Christian needs to tell about it in their own language. And that news went out into all the languages of earth. That's what happened at Pentecost. At any rate, the greatest example of the wind blowing on the craziest person I have yet to introduce you to. 
and it's how the whole end of the book of Acts will end. After these exhibits that I told you about, I dare say the best was saved for last. We're first introduced to a nameless character, almost, when the first Christian, Stephen, is martyred by stoning. There was a small, underage, I should say, young is what I meant to say, persecutor of Christians there, a guy by the name of Saul, who said, I'll hold your jacket so you can better stone him. Later, we're told that this Saul was born both a Roman and a Jew. Double reasons to quash this new religion of the way. We know that Saul was educated under Gamaliel, one of the leading philosophers of the day. Staunch persecutor of Christians, enjoyed Roman citizenship, but knew the Old Testament law backward and forward as a Jew, and a smart guy. His name was Saul. Saul volunteers to the authorities to take a trip up to Damascus because he's heard that there's this new group of Christians, people of the way, starting a, a, a new congregation up there, and he volunteers to go up there to shut them down. On his way to Damascus, he's struck by a light, can't see. He's led into Damascus where for three days he stays in blindness until later he'll say something like scales fell from his eyes. And he saw for the first time, spiritually and physically. And what he saw is that that bright light on the Damascus road was none other than the risen Lord Jesus. It so changes Saul in his perspective that he even matches that with a name change. And now that he's become a believer in Jesus Christ, he changes his name from Saul to Paul, the greatest Christian missionary ever to live, the foundational one. He now will go on no less than three missionary journeys all around the Mediterranean basin and set up these first century churches. And so Christianity will explode because of Paul's work. And that's how the book of Acts will end. It begins with Pentecost, Luke volume two. It tells us as by way of exemplars, some of the craziest characters that become a Christian and the craziest of them all, Saul, who then becomes known as Paul, finishes out the book by documenting his three missionary journeys. It's really that easy. And I hope I've inspired you to go back and read more about it. And we're gonna talk more about Paul and his epistles, which is just a fancy word for letters, that will almost conclude the rest of the New Testament. But for today, what you learned is the word Pentecost, 50 days from Easter, not from Ascension. Remember, it was Easter, 40 days to Ascension, 10 days after Ascension, which makes it 50 from Easter, is Pentecost. We learned of wind and fire. We learned today what a Pentecostalist Christian would believe and how others don't hold to the exact kind of teaching there from Acts 2 and 3. We learned about the word epistle, which is just means letter. We learned about the word proselytize, which just means to preach. And we learned that the first gatherings of Christians were technically called people of the way. They replaced circumcision with baptism, and now they will start meeting every uh, Sunday morning or Sunday night in homes of wealthy people, not because God loves the rich, but because wealthy people then would have a home with a large room. Today we'd say a living room or family room where they could meet and they would pull the shades and they would pray together. They would have the agape meal, the meal of love 
and they would remember, as Jesus told them, to break the bread, to drink the cup, and in doing that, remember how he came to break his body and to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. They would invite their friends and convert them with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then they would read correspondence. It's about that that we'll turn to next.